Let's take a look today at some of the particular joints in the human body. Let's start up here with a temporomandibular joint, or your temporal bone in your mandible meat. People often talk about this just being called TMJ, which is obviously an abbreviation. That's a combination of a plane and ellipsoid joint. And either side, either side of your skull, left and right, where these bones meet, you've got two very strong fibrocartilage pads. Remember, these are like cushions or shock absorbers. You think about all the power when you bite down on something, that's a lot of pressure, and that's why we need those discs there. There's a lot of motion associated with this joint. You get depression and elevation as the mandible goes up and down. Lateral and medial excursion, side-to-side -side grinding action on the back teeth like the molars and premolars. And then protraction and retraction is the sliding of that mandible forward and back. Often with these little fibrocartilage pads, sometimes they get in a bind in between these bones and they get pressure built up and they pop as they snap back into place. And that causes a lot of disorders with that joint. Next down here, we have the shoulder, the glenohumeral joint, <clears throat> getting its name from the glenoid cavity of the scapula, where the head of the humerus fits into it. It's one of the places we have ball and socket joints. Remember, ball and socket joints are only found at the hips and the shoulders. And the one at the shoulder is very freely movable. We see a lot of motion associated with it, flexing and extension, forward and back, anterior and posterior movement, you see largely, abduction and adduction where you move laterally and medially, like when you do jumping jacks. Rotation of that humerus can occur. Circumduction, which is that big cone-shaped motion when you swing your hand around in a big wide circle. Also helping to hold the head of that humerus in place is a structure called the glenoid labrum. Think of that as like a cup of fibrocartilage that helps to hold the head of that humerus into that cavity. This is one of the places we have a bursa, one of these fluid-filled cavities, filled with very slippery fluid. It's just like oil in your car, cuts down on friction, helps those structures to last longer. And whenever ever people talk about damage to their shoulder, they generally talk about damage to their rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is not a single structure. That's a combination of four muscles, six ligaments, that glenoid labrum, the bursa cavity that produces the fluid and any other cartilage and bone and structures in that region. The tendon of the biceps brachii muscle passes right through this joint capsule. You don't see that too often. Let's go to our elbow. Good example of a hinge joint. Remember, if you look at a hinge like you see on a door, you basically got a round cylinder with something that's C-shaped around it. So if you look at the hinge on a door, and then you look right here at the very distal end of your humerus and the proximal end of that ulna, that's what you have. The end of that humerus is somewhat rounded, sort of like a rod, and then right up here on the very top proximal part of that on it, C-shaped, fitting around it. You also see the head of the radius rotating whenever you flip your hand, prone and supine. That long bone does just turn on its long axis. There's lots of ligaments holding the radius and the ulna together, and the subacromial bursa is found in this region too. Go down to your hip or coxal joints getting its name from the two big coxal bones found on the left and right side. That's what makes up the bulk of your hip. But of course, posterior, you got the sacrum to the back. And then anterior, can't see it in this picture right here, cartilage helping to hold that together. That's the symphysis pubis we saw in another video. So here's another place where you have a ball and socket joint, just like your shoulder. But this ball and socket joint here is a whole lot more stable than what your shoulder is. You've got much bigger tendons, ligaments, muscles, and other structures helping to hold the head of that femur into that acetabulum. So it's not damaged as often as what that shoulder would be. Lots of motion associated here. There's flexing and extending, abduction and adduction, rotation and circumduction, just like you saw with your shoulder, no different. So again, very strong joint. And if you look at the head of that femur, you can see what looks almost like a little round spot where that round ligament of the femur passes through that region. Don't see that in too many joints. Looking down here at your knee, it's lots of structures that help your knee. You've got these fibrocartilage pads in between the distal end of the femur and the proximal end of your tibia. It's what people call the meniscus. Sometimes when you feel your knee pop, that's those pads getting into a bind and pressure builds and then they suddenly pop back into place. That happens on a regular basis. You can damage those pads. And remember, they're cushions. They're just like rubber pads in between those bones. They help as shock absorbers. It's the whole weight of your body comes down on that knee region. That's very good to have.
But you can also see in this picture all these very big strong ligaments which help to hold all these bones and other structures together. You probably heard of some of these before like the ACL. The anterior cruciate ligament prevents any anterior displacement of the tibia. The posterior cruciate, PCL, prevents any posterior displacement. The tibial collateral prevents a medial displacement. And the fibular collateral ligament prevents a lateral. So look what you got. Ligaments that are protecting that tibia from moving too far front, back, left or right, inside or out. Now these collateral and popliteal ligaments are very strong structures. There's popliteal ligaments around that region where you have all these big strong tendons from your thigh muscles definitely work to strengthen that joint. And here's another good example of where you got a bursa, fluid filled cavity in this region around this joint. Knee injuries are very common. Look at weightlifters and football players. People can put too much weight on that knee and one of those ligaments above can snap. Sometimes more than one of them does. Football players get hit at the knees quite often. They get hit from the outside. That uh, little ligament on the inside often tends to just pull and snap. You get damage to this bursa, this fluid-filled cavity, any of the structures in it that would cause bursitis. Something else that can be seen are chondromalacia, a softening of the cartilage due to abnormal movement of the patella, Overuse of it tends to cause that. You get accumulation of fluid, often causing pain. Hemarthrosis, which is an acute accumulation of blood after injury. Now we get down to our ankle here. Very highly modified hinge joint. Now you get some lateral and medial movement, right? Not too much because of a thickening of the capsule that prevents a lot of that. But again, if you think about inversion or eversion, we saw these movements in a previous video where you roll, say, to the outside of your ankle, take the bottom of your foot in, or eversion is just the opposite, taking the bottom of the foot out, can happen. And usually if somebody gets too much of that rolling down in that ankle to the inside or outside, that's when they snap off the very end of their tibia or fibula. Remember, at the very end of those bones, down there in the ankle, they have those lateral and medial malleolus. That's the very end of that tibia and fibula. That's what you feel is those two big bumps in your ankle. That's usually when that damaged is excessive movement with inversion or eversion. But of course, you also got the dorsiflexion and the plantar flexion where you go up on your toes or your heel. There are lots of ligaments binding and hold all these small bones together. Looking at the effects of aging, tissue is going to repair slower everywhere but it can often be worse in joints because remember a lot of these joints don't have blood vessels penetrating them. You don't see blood vessels penetrating an area, it's gonna be a whole lot slower to repair. And of course, damage to these joints is common, especially at the knees and the shoulder and other places, lower back. Those cartilages found at the articulation at the joint where the bones come together <clears throat> are gonna eventually wear down. When you lose that hard, smooth, glassy, hyaline cartilage over the end of those bones, you start to grind bone on bone, and that's what causes most arthritis. You'll lose the synovial fluid, that little hyaluronic acid that's that very slippery stuff. It's just like losing the oil in your car engine. Those parts are going to wear a whole lot faster. You'll see damage to the ligaments and tendons, and also they get less flexible, so it's easier to snap them later in life. The muscles get weaker, which you'll lose flexibility because of that, and all that will add up together. Looking at a few joint disorders, arthritis is the most common. And again, most of that's going to be osteoarthritis. Due to the natural effects of aging, you're going to wear down and destroy those structures in those joints. Rheumatoid is usually caused by an autoimmune disease where the body's destroyed the cartilage in that joint. There's also joint infections like Lyme disease and tuberculosis. Gout, which is a buildup of uric acid, can cause the depositing of uric crystal in those joints. It'd be just like throwing something hard like sand in between those uh, bones at those joints. That would cause grinding and tearing. And of course, somebody may need joint replacement if one or more of those structures is damaged enough.